Welcome to Department of Emergency Medicine uh, Grand Rounds. And it's my pleasure to bring back to the stage uh, Kendall Ho, uh, who is um, uh, so far out there related to the what used to be called eHealth, as he was the director of the eHealth Strategy Office for five years at least. I think. Yeah, seven years. And, um, and now he has blessed us by leaving that position and coming uh, home to the Department of Emergency Medicine to lead um, what is now redefined as digital emergency medicine. Uh, uh, and so the, the digital health, but focused on what we can do within emergency medicine. And that's what he's going to talk to us about today, is how this is going to be practice changing and beneficial for the system. And um, we're on the cutting edge of that, but there is uh, so much before us that we have to do that it's going to be a very, very exciting over the next few years as we do that, and Kendall's going to lead that. So, Kendall, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be here to speak a little bit about digital emergency medicine in an area I'm very interested in, passionate in, and hope that by the end of this presentation that I can get you excited about digital emergency medicine and how this is in many ways transforming how we practice medicine, how we connect with our patients, and how we connect with each other. Um, maybe before I start, um, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a frozen screen. <laughs> uh, aha, Greg, my slides don't seem to be advancing. Um, I hate that hourglass. <laughs> or the, or, um, um, what I'd like to do, oh, there we go. Um, what, how many of you have seen this video? Uh, it, okay, I see some good hands coming up, that's great. It's a video in uh, Stockholm, in one of the uh, uh, subway station. And the project was, how do you get people to choose the stairs, as opposed to taking the escalator? And they have used a technology approach to actually improve that. And, um, and so it's very similar to, in some ways, what we talk about today. How can we leverage technology, not to replace what we do, but accelerate and improve what we do when we treat our patients in the emergency department, when we interact with each other? I'll come back to you at the end uh, with the uh, video. Uh, if you can keep that in mind uh, for the uh, presentation. Over the next 40 minutes, what I'd like to do is like to look at three things. One is some of the examples of how technology is already infiltrating into how we practice in emergency medicine. And then I really want to delve into the principles behind why those things work and how do those principles take us into the next decade in terms of using technology to advance in emergency medicine. And I want to come back and say, how do we as emergency physicians and how do we as emergency health pro professionals participate in this transformation? And I'd love to have 15 minutes to have a, a dialogue with you at the end with that conversation. When we think about our patients coming to emergency department, they're really, in some ways, three phases. The phase of before they're coming into emergency department, the phase of the journey in the emergency department when we see them, and when they leave the emergency department. And in fact, all three phases involve the use of technology. It's not surprising to you that, in fact, uh, two years ago, a statistic suggests that more than nine out of 10 patients before they see health professionals would have gone onto the internet. So sites like Medicine Plus uh, is a national library of medicine, evidence-based information about our patients. You look up in the left, up, uh, to your right upper corner, uh, you know, just put in dizziness and a whole bunch of articles spills out. So a lot of patients would have gone on site before they come into emergency departments. Now, of course, people who get into car accidents, they don't lie on the stretcher and text before they come in, <laughs> unlikely. But many other patients, chest pain, dizziness, short of breath, they probably have gone on site and look at the information. Uh, this is an app that I do recommend to a lot of people, a lot of patients. Uh, in fact, it's uh, put out by Canadian Red Cross. Uh, by the way, uh, feel free to pull out your mobile phones anytime throughout this presentation. If I'm boring, do your emails. <laughs> if you find that some of these are interesting, you can immediately download like this app. It's called First Aid App. Uh, if you have your iPhone or your Android, uh, they're both available. And so what it does is download to your mobile phone, and for the patients, they can immediately pull out things like an asthma attack look like. What does a heart attack look like? And they'll give you some instructions. For example, if you have a burn, what are some of the things that you need to do before you visit an emergency department? And there's some bonus in there. For example, how do you prepare for a earthquake? What are some of the seven things you absolutely need to do in your home and in yourselves 
to prepare for earthquakes. So all those are contained in that particular free app. Doesn't cost you any money put out by Canadian Red Cross. Patients also turn to sites like Patients Like Me, social media group, so that they can get together with people with the same diseases, diabetes, heart attack, so they can share tips. And very often, as emergency, they would then go into these sites and say, geez, I have these symptoms. Do you guys have it too? Uh, when you have it, do you go to emergency department for this? So sites like this bring people together. Uh, Jillian Code, uh, uh, a, co a colleague of mine, a, a patient uh, who works, uh, who participate in one of our research studies together. Uh, she herself is a professor at SFU. She had heart transplant. In fact, in January this year, you may have seen her article in Vancouver Sun talking about it. Uh, she has a, a, a website talking about, she had a Twitter site talking about heart failure, talking about uh, cardiac transplants. Uh, again, many, many of these examples of groups of people using social media to connect. Um, James Hillman, a great colleague of ours, uh, work in Cranbrook. Uh, in fact, he set up in Wikipedia a wiki project medicine. Uh, again, a great site for information, uh, especially um, we talk about, we always laugh about it, you know, patients say, uh, when they go to Google, Dr. Google, or they go to Wikipedia. In fact, uh, Dr. Hillman has proven that, in fact, many health professionals also go to Wikipedia. In fact, some of the information of Wikipedia is even better than textbook. In fact, last year, he proved in a case where there's an Oxford Press, Oxford Press book that came out, they actually plagiarized from Wikipedia on some of the information there. And so all this information, our patient would have access to it, and by the time they come into a merchant department, they would have armed with nine out of 10 of our patients would have had information in the background when they see us, asking us, what's my chest pain about? And sometimes I think about merchant department like Disneyland. You know, when people come in, uh, you know, I go to Disneyland, I go line up for three or four hours for one minute roller coaster ride. And so in many ways, they come into a merchant department, wait three or four hours so that they can see one of us, nurse, physician, give them perspective for 15, 30 minutes, and then upon discharge, and they say, well, we should do this, do this, do this. And it's often, they go around three or four hours. In fact, for those of you who work in Vancouver General Hospital, Merchant Department, uh, I work in treatment, for example, there's a computer that is next to a patient's bed. And many times when I look at a computer, I'll hear the patients talking. You know, at one time, I have an orthopedic surgeon, uh, orthopedic resident who came and talked to the patient and said, well, you broke the tibia, and so we need to do operations. So two minutes, and so the orthopedic resident left. And guess what? The patient, while waiting for admission, immediately over the next 15 minutes, start going on the internet, discussing with his wife, oh, tibia fracture, oh, I need to watch out for fat amboli. These are the type of things that I'm anticipating. This is my recovery rate, this is my prognosis. Our patients are doing that. In fact, when you think about the patients in the waiting room, in waiting for us, after see us, waiting for results, all these times they can go to sites like Wikipedia, Medline Plus to search for their information. When they get discharged, what do we do? Well, sometimes I do prescribe apps to them. For example, this might be an interesting app for someone who came in with palpitations. How often is like palpitations like me bring my car to my mechanic? You know, I, say, I hear this funny noise. And, uh, invariable, when I go to mechanic, that funny noise doesn't happen anymore, right? And so the mechanic says, well, I can't do anything about it, right? So patient come in, palpitations. You know, we come in three hours, four hours, troponin negative, ECG monitoring negative. We send them home, say, Holter in about 24 hours, et cetera. But one of the things sometimes I do for those patients is, well, here's a free app. It's called Heart Rate. Again, you can download onto your phone, uh, mobile, uh, 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 Apple, or um, uh, Android. By touching your finger onto the light source, you can actually monitor your heart rate. Uh, on the phone itself, it's a regular heart rate, 73. On the screen, it's actually myself three years ago when I felt palpitations. And so I put my finger onto it. You see that mountain with two peaks? Well, in fact, I was in Bigemini. And it was actually correlate to an ECG at that time. And so because of that, I slept better. I drank less coffee. I feel much better. Fortunately, I don't have any more Bigemini. But this is a tool free, available now for patients to use, uh, to help themselves. Uh, here's another one that I do prescribe to patients who take medications but don't have a list. And so they can program and put their medications onto this uh, MediSafe, uh, this list. It's in Chinese because I actually uh, gave a talk in, in Hong Kong about this, and, and it's available in Chinese and uh, different languages. 
Um, and uh, you can program. For example, uh, you can see that four quadrants is the morning, afternoon, evening, and overnight times that you take your pills. You can also program the color of the pills. In the case of the capsule, yellow and, and red, that's amoxicillin. So you can actually choose the color to program that pill, and at the right time, the alarm on your mobile phone will ring so the patient will remember taking the pill. And also for me, it's helpful because they can just turn the list to me and say, here are the medication I'm taking, here's the frequency. Help me to help my patient in that area. And mind you, many patients already go home using their monitoring devices, their smartwatch, uh, Apple, or Fitbit, uh, to check, you know, and now recently when I exercise, do I get more shorter breaths so that I walk less? Do I sleep worse? Do I wake up in the middle of the night because of the shortness of breath? And all these are now available for the patients at their fingertips. I remember when I came out of emergency, residency, I mean, it's about me telling the patient, here's your diagnosis, here are some of the things that you need to know, and we go home, here's the discharge plan. Patient probably remember about 10% of what I said. But now, with the range of digital technology before they come in the emergency department, during the emergency journey, when you give them a diagnosis, they can look it up, there's a vagal syndrome. When you discharge them, they can go home and actually continue to have the information and also have these type of devices help them out. It would be incredible. How many people yourselves have access to my eHealth in British Columbia? Yeah. So many patients now, well, anyone in British Columbia can sign up for this service so that after you take a blood test and within hours of the results coming out, they can actually look at it online. And in fact, in BC, we have the best access across Canada. About 36% of patients have access to their own lab tests, whereas across the country, it's about 10 to 15%. So all the lab tests that we do in the emergency department, you know, I know my colleagues and I, we have a habit of giving a copy of this to our patients for a few years. At St. Paul's, you do it very, very well with discharge summaries and also with the numbers. The patients themselves can go home now and actually check their own lab tests. In fact, in the, uh, in the My eHealth portal, they also discuss about some of the abnormalities of lab tests, what that might look like, and why they may be abnormal. And so patients have access to all this information. Now, so the digital journey for the patients has improved a lot. What about for ourselves? In fact, amongst health professionals, some of the really fantastic ways that we can now gather our information, for example, a lot of uh, uh, my, my colleagues and my residents taught me about EMRAP to be able to listen to a podcast so that uh, we keep up to date with the information. Historically, when I did residency, read the Rosen, read the Tintinelli, talk to colleagues, and now we have communities like EMRAP who can actually online share some of those activities. Very fortunately, five years ago, I get to meet Dr. Mike Cardigan from Australia, really started the whole online movement of, uh, uh, of uh, learning online. Um, and on evidence-based, uh, a free online uh, medical education or phone. And a tremendous opportunity as emergency. He's actually one of the leading, uh, like not only emergency medicine, but really worldwide in actually breaking this uh, wide in getting communities of physicians working together. My colleague, uh, Heather Lindsay, a uh, Vancouver General, very keen on social media. And in fact, in the emergency department, she's already set up a, a, a small site a site for the Vancouver General Hospital, emergency physicians. And one of the things that she does is she shares something called aptitude, apps for health professionals. For example, in this one in February, uh, she featured the one on toxicology that you can again download for free onto your mobile app, uh, look at the different agents, uh, and then have symptoms about what are some of the things you look for uh, for that. Later on, I'll give you a, set, uh, a way to get in and get those uh, aptitudes, uh, the list of things that she has looked at. And so in some ways, ladies and gentlemen, the journey of the patients, digital has transformed the way that they get information before they come, during the journey, and also after they get discharged. And for us as health professionals, again, the journey of online learning, sharing amongst ourselves some of the tips and pearls, and how do we deliver care, again, is being transformed very rapidly in front of us. The question I think I'm going to ask in the second part of my presentation is, if we build this, would we come? Would our patients use it? Would us as health professionals use it? But more importantly, will we use it together, patients and health professionals, to improve the care of emergency medicine, not only globally, but in here at St. Paul's? 
at Vancouver General, at Kelowna, at Victoria, in BC, every corner of it would happen. Let me turn my attention now to the second part of my presentation. We look at some of the digital technologies that we looked at. Why does it work? What might be some of the things that influence that make it work? And what are some of the principles that I believe will continue over the next decade to guide how we use digital technologies? I submit to you three principles. One is about engagement. Um, as you see, I'm Chinese. <laughs> I speak Chinese, and so very often I kind of think about, you know, oh, what, engage. What is it, what, what's the Chinese word for engage? And uh, so I come up with two terms. One term is, uh, in Chinese, we usually use two words, at least, to describe a thing. So in this case, the two characters that used to describe engage is participate together, tam yu, to participate together. I thought that was a good term, you know, about engage, but it doesn't quite scratch the full dimension of engage. In fact, there's a second term about engage, is to throw into, to throw yourself into it. So I think with those, it really starts to capture the essence of engage, to throw yourself into a crowd, to participate together, to do something, engage. I'd submit to you that before the arrival of digital emergency medicine, of digital health, two decades ago, three decades ago, many decades ago when I first started my practice, uh, that physicians are more engaged than patients. And in fact, we are in this seesaw board, the person controls the up and down the board. We tell the patients, you have this diagnosis, you need to change, you need to lose weight, you need to smoke, etc. But I submit to you that over the last decade and more, patients now are much more engaged than health professionals and physicians. In fact, they are the ones that are asking us help me in improving my health. And sometimes we lag behind a lot. Here's some examples. Um, 2012, Forbes magazine published this article, patient engagement is the blockbuster drug of the century. And this author talked about a Kaiser Permanente study in 2009 for patients with heart attack. Uh, for 90 days post cardiac attack, they give the same medications, so all patients got exposed to the same medications. One group get the usual care, the other group got coordinated care so that they have exercise plans, diet plans, uh, uh, sleep, rest, etc. And they found that by not changing any one medication, but by the patients being engaged, 88% reduction in dying of cardiac-related causes, 76% reduction in overall mortality of this group of patients. Not one additional drug, but just by the patients being engaged. How do we as emergency physicians, as we see our patients, engage our patients? Or I should turn that around and say, how do we support their engagement before they come in, they look up their disease? During the journey, we are already talking with them at discharge. How do we continue to support them in their engagement? Now, I got two kids, 22 and 18, uh, so I'm very interested in the millennials. And uh, in fact, uh, a really interesting study early on uh, in 2015, last year now, the eight trends shaping the future of digital health. Take a look, six out of 10 want to use technology to see the doctors, telehealth, six out of 10. Seven out of 10 want not only use mobile apps, but they want physicians to prescribe mobile apps to them. Six out of 10 wants wearable data, not just to wear their watches, but they want health professionals to monitor with them on the disease. And uh, 76, three out of four one online reviews to select a doctor like us, you know, that Dr. Ho, I'll never want to see him in the emergency department. Uh, take a look at the last two. Uh, six out of 10 want 3D printing. You know, why do I have to go to see an orthotics person, get one of these, you know, orthotic device and then go to the shop and buy it? Why can't I just, you know, step on a machine, get a 3D printing of that orthotics and slip into my shoe right away? Why can't I do that? And the last one, 57% said, I want cutting edge devices. I'm gonna swallow a pill, and it proves that it swallows the pill. The device will tell my mobile phone I swallowed the pill, and so I've swallowed the pill. Very interesting, and in uh, December, I had a uh, wonderful opportunity to go to Hawaii with my kids and, and my family and my wife. And so every morning, we had a routine of walking. And so one morning, after five minutes of walking, my son says, I can't walk anymore. And I said, what, why, what's wrong? He said, well, I forgot my Fitbit at at the hotel, so if I don't have my Fitbit, I won't be recording my steps, 
And if that's the case, I've wasted my morning walks. I'm not going to walk. <laughs> it's amazing. You know, they want everything recorded, so including swallowing pills. Well, guess what? January this year, January this year, Barton Health in, in California is now prescribing ingestible sensors to patients with hypertension. Ladies and gentlemen, it's coming. All these different kinds of wearable, it's being done at this particular time. Now, you may say, well, millennials, of course, they're very keen, but what does that do with our general patients? Well, here's another study, early 2015. People 65 years or older in US, 65 or older, two thirds of them want to use mobile technology for health. So it's estimated about 3.9 million people turned 65 last year at, uh, in US. And what do they want to use it for? Well, self-care tools. They want to manage their own health. They want wearables to monitor their own activities and health. They want online communities so that they can talk to each other and share. They want the mobile phone to help them to navigate the health system. How do I get to see a doctor? How do I get to talk about my symptoms? How can I continue to manage emergencies on those? And finally, they want access to their health record tools, not just about lab tests, but how do I get to see my electronic health record that we create with our patients? Now, here's the flip side. Uh, this is a chart showing how physicians are using digital technology. It's, a, it's an ongoing survey, and you can see that uh, in terms of how the patients are accessing and interacting with primary care doctors in the U.S. Uh, the first uh, row, 50% do phone call appointments, uh, and 28% use a portal to log in and see your own information only electronic health record. That's a rise from last year of 13%. There are certain pockets in British Columbia where patients can access their physician's electronic record. As far as I know, at this point, no hospital, no health authority has opened that up to our patients yet. Online app appointment scheduling, one out of uh, five have access to that online scheduling. Uh, email appointments, uh, the fourth and the fifth, uh, email correspondence about your health, communication via online messaging, don't do that. We don't routinely do that. How do we consider the possibilities of that? I'm not saying that we should do all our diagnosis, management, everything online, but how do we think about secure text messaging online? Now Frank has already done some fantastic work about ECGs and, and chest X-rays and secure text messaging. How do we leverage those kind of things in the way that we deliver care that our patient want? So principle one, engagement. Second principle, how do we take intention into action? Go back to that uh, uh, subway station. How do we change people so that they may intend to want to take the stairs, but how do we actually help them take the stairs? How do we push them forward? Well, I submit to you that there are three ingredients in digital health that will help our patients and help ourselves to actually take action. The first of them is about the movement of quantify self. I want to measure myself. Here's a graph in one of the earlier sites on the quantify self movement. Uh, I presume this is a male, and I presume he's trying to lose weight, because I don't know this person's identity. Well, the reason I guess that is because if you look at this chart, the blue is how much caloric intake he takes in the morning, the red is in midday, and green is in evening. On average, this person taking about 2,500 calories a day. Now, for a person like myself, it's about 1,800 calories to maintain my weight. So if I want to gain weight, I have to eat more. If I have loose weight, I have to eat less, I guess. Whereas for a female, like my wife, it's about 1,003 to 1,400 calories. So this person's going at around 2,005, so significantly higher. And secondly, uh, the two sentences he wrote, my behavior is predictable, I lack discipline on the weekends. Well, take a look, some of those weekends, he actually peak at around 3,000 calories. 3,000 calories, double what a general male needs, uh, an average male like myself needs uh, to maintain weight. But then on Mondays, some of those valleys actually dip to 1,000 calories. Well, how much is 1,000 calories, ladies and gentlemen? It's one and a third cup of peanuts. That's 1,000 calories. Or if you go to uh, hamburger joints, a hamburger and onion rings, 1,000 calories right there. So this person says, my behavior is predictable, I lack discipline on weekends. Imagine this person coming into our merchant department with chest pain for the first time. 
And so we did all the things, you know, did what Jim says, you know, do your troponin twice, make sure everything's okay. And so at the end of it, no, oh, sorry, I, I got to update my knowledge there. <laughs> and at the end of it, I said, well, sir, I'm very glad it's not a, not a heart attack. But I thought, oh, this is a great teachable moment. Sir, I noticed that you're a little bit overweight. I'd suggest that you should lose weight. Guess what this person would say? Probably he would say, thank you, doctor, you're right, I should lose weight. But that's not what this person needs. He already knows he's intending to lose weight. He just doesn't know how to lose weight. And so the challenge for us is not only to understand that 9 out of 10 patients come to the emergency department already having certain knowledge, but how do we support this patient from intention to activities, to behavioral change? And so I share with you some of the apps that we have. Uh, uh, I put together a bit of a healthy apps page, uh, and it's to list some of the types of um, apps that would be helpful for patients. For example, a sleep app to help them to monitor their sleep in terms of MyFitnessPal, which is one of the caloric counts, and also MindShift, uh, done by Anxiety BC to manage mental health, mental wellness, some relaxation techniques, some of the ways that they can actually imagine and do mindfulness exercise to help them in anxiety. I'll come back to that. I really welcome your participation on that uh, area of healthy apps. So one, quantify self. Secondly, how do we look at changing from intention to behavioral change? It's about social. It's about sharing. In fact, this is cured together similar to patients like me. This site, uh, it asks patients together. In this case, for example, they asked 106, I think, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome patients and said, what works for you when you have chronic fatigue syndrome? And so take a look at right upper corner, uh, rest, uh, very popular, but very effective. Right lower corner, exercise, very popular, not that effective in generally. But the left upper corner is interesting. For example, low dose naltrexone, not popular, but perhaps surprisingly effective. And so if a patient comes in the emergency department on the weekend and said, listen, you know, I got chronic fatigue syndrome, and usually I'm pretty well maintained, but this particular weekend I feel particularly weak, generally dizzy, I'm not sure if I have a heart attack. At the end of it, it says, geez, you know, I wonder if low dose naltrexone is helpful for me. Um, of course, I'm not suggesting this is a randomized controlled trial. I'm not suggesting this is the evidence that guides our practice. But you can understand why that patient would ask that question. And how do we as health professionals support this type of behavior? Or at least discuss, well, in your case, now Trexone is actually absolutely contraindicated because of these reasons. Or maybe say, well, you know, there's some merit to why you look into this. And maybe I'll look into it. Maybe you should discuss your family doctor in moving that forward. Interesting, when uh, uh, the iPhone 6 uh, was released, uh, one of the sleeper application was about asking patients to participate in research. And uh, it's the iHealth portal. In fact, for those of you with iPhone, you can certainly sign up right now. So when we first came out, the pundits on the first 20 files says, yeah, it's kind of cute, you know, getting patients involved in research study. But, you know, they, they don't know the implication of research. Why would they participate in this? Why would they go into a site to do this? Well, guess what? In 24 hours, this tweet came up from Stanford universities. In 24 hours, they sign up 11,000 patients for a research study through that portal. What they take 50 medical centers to do in a year, they sign up in 24 hours. Our patients are activated. They are motivated. They are engaged. They want to participate in these areas. How do we as researchers and clinicians participate in that ourselves. Third, so one, quantify self. Two, social. Three, about wearables. Huge opportunities. Well, you heard about the watch. You may have known about Google contact lens over the last few years. For example, one of the projects is put the eye to detect glucose in the tears so that they can continuously track glucose. Uh, this, the next four things, happen this year, January 2016, at the uh, consumers Electronic Showcase in Las Vegas. A uh, huge explosion of wearables this year. Uh, Fitbit's coming out with the Blaze, the watch. This is L'Oreal, the, uh, the cosmetic company. Come with my UV patch by putting it onto your skin. You know how much UV light you got exposed when you go sun tanning so that you can then stop at a certain time. Um, here's an um, uh, IT bed. So when you sleep, not only does it tell you whether you toss and turn, 
but actually demonstrate pressure source, your heart rate, how well you sleep, do you wake up, do you get short of breath, oxygen saturation, all that in the bed. Here's MedWand, um, a device. Not only does it look into your ears, look in your eyes, uh, take your temperature, but that cone shape at the bottom is to do a cardiac echo. So you can actually put it over your heart, actually demonstrate an echo cardiogram onto it. A, a diagnostic device that you may be carrying very soon in your pocket. Uh, this one's a December 2015 release. Uh, it's a Band-Aid where only when there's bacteria growing would that Band-Aid turn fluorescent. And so the idea is that if you have a wound, you may not need to prescribe antibiotic until that fluorescent thing turns on. Now, this was just in January, published in Nature. Published in Nature. Uh, Berkeley, together with Stanford uh, Medical School, collaborate on this wearable, so it actually, real time, measure the chemistry in your sweat to measure electrolytes, your hydration states, and do those measurements. Publish in Nature. Ladies and gentlemen, we are looking at five vital signs now. Uh, with these wearables, we don't know what vital signs we'll be looking at. And how do we welcome this era with these type of technology coming down as an avalanche towards us? Guess what? In uh, um, uh, um, NHS, National Health Services in UK, uh, this just got uh, published in January uh, this year. Uh, they're going in the next decade full force into wearables to support patient care. And in seven of their key projects, some of them are monitoring heart failure and COPD patients at home. Uh, a couple of them is looking at monitoring mental health. And one of them specifically is looking at dementia using wearables to help these patients. Health system adopting this into their practices. How do we respond as health professionals? And so, ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that in digital health, in order to influence behavioral change, to change from intention to practice, these three elements are important. Quantify self, social sharing, and wearables. Well, in fact, it's not very different from a theory that a psychologist in 1986 already talked about. What do we need to do for us to change behavior? The three things he said, Bandera said, is one, we need to monitor ourselves, what our baseline. And second, we need to evaluate our baseline and say, what's the gap? Where do we want to change to? And then three is to modify our behavior accordingly and then continue to measure ourselves as we move forward. And I submit to you that digital medicine help us, help our patients to get to this area. 2014, a study in, uh, uh, in exercise physiology, uh, Professor Bob Rog looked at five key elements based on meta-analysis, how this can change behavior. One, physical activity profile, to understand what your profile is. Two, set the goals. Three, real-time feedback of that goal. And four, having a social support network. And five is where we come in. We as health experts supporting our patients in their care. I'd like you to remember this photo, if you can, because we don't do that in health. People in exercise and dancing do. A person dance in front of a mirror with their instructor and their community. So when the instructor says you need to achieve this line, he or she can see the line right away on the mirror. And if he or she can't achieve it, he can ask some of his colleagues and say, hey, how'd you do that? In health, what we do is they come to the emergency department and we say, well, you need to lose weight quit smoking, et cetera. But they don't have a mirror, or we don't support them in the mirror, and we don't have the social group to support them. How do we participate so that our patients will have this in healthcare to help them achieve a better line, better health in that area? We've done an uh, experiment over the last two years. And in fact, we finished our study in uh, October looking at diabetic patients at home. We monitor the weights, the blood pressure, their glucose, uh, and the heart rate. We also have health professionals once a week text them information about how to manage the diabetes. And also we invite them to join with a group of patients and caregivers together to talk about the diseases. Well, over a three-month period, uh, in general, patients reduce the A1C from 7.41 to below 7. 7 is considered a good number for control. And so over three months, using the combination, they reduce it to 6.77. They achieve a weight loss on average 3.5. And they have blood pressure reduction, health stress reduction, and they feel more empowered in terms of managing disease. Here's a couple of quotes. Uh, the top one, 
really like the idea of people connecting with each other so that we support each other, the social aspect of it. The bottom quote, the achievement of the goal, and even I may not achieve the goal, but I get the support uh, to be able to get to where I want, the honesty and the sincerity of that community. These are the elements that will change from intention to behavioral change. How do we support that? My last uh, third principle, perhaps, in how we move forward is us. How do we not only practice in, by ourselves, but work with our professionals, interprofessional collaboration, really towards patient-centered care? How often do our patients coordinate their information? So when they go to GP, the GP will ask them, well, what did the emergency physician say to you when you get discharged? And the patient will recount the 10 or 12% that he or she recalls to the family doctor. Um, how do we leverage patient data? In fact, I'm very glad Eric walks in because the idea of leveraging that data in emergent departments and share that with our, emergency, with our colleagues in the community. How do we do in uh, Vancouver General, thanks to Chad and, um, and, um, and Dave, champion the whole dictation so that when the patient leaves the emergent department that they get the discharge summary. In fact, at St. Paul's, you do them very well for many years now. We're just catching up Vancouver General Hospital. And I'd be interested in Kelowna and Victoria and also the province, how you are doing in terms of giving that patient the discharge summary to go home so that they don't have to do the communication themselves. How do we as health professionals work together with our nurses, with our physicians, physiotherapists, pharmacists, look at telehealth, using that as a technology to support our patients, look at secure messaging so that we can actually talk to each other. Our residents and medical students are already texting on the ward for handover rounds. How do we actually also adopt that so that we can do handover safely and efficiently uh, in our care of our patients? And finally, how do patients get access to that record? Not just the lab tests, but what we talked about, what our diagnosis is, how can they participate in that? So I'm going to spend the last five minutes on our roles in digital emergency medicine and invite, to some, invite you to some of the activities, and I'll stop and uh, hope to hear your thoughts on it. What's our role? Well, with the patient safety and quality, I think Julian uh, will speak to that uh, as our in-house expert, uh, there's a phrase, nothing about me without me. Uh, patients is, is my body, it's my treatments, my genes, my evidence. Help me get better. Work with me together on that. So in that sense, what are some of our roles to support our patients? I submit to you five key roles that we should play, not only today, but as we move forward. The first role is to discern, is to say, well, yeah, this app is generally good for many people, but is it good for my patients? In fact, patients are asking that question. That's why they want us to prescribe apps to them. That's why they want us to say, well, is this information relevant to me? It may be relevant to everybody, but is it relevant to me? How do we help the patient discern? And how do we leverage our experience and expertise to do that? Uh, for the patients, uh, they have the disease for the first time. For us, we may have seen it many times. I remember, I don't know how many of you have the medical student syndrome. You know, every disease I study, I think I have it. In fact, I was convinced in my four years that I had lupus, and I was convinced in the four years I have aortic regurgitation. It's still stuck in my mind right now. But it's through life, through seeing different patients, through listening to cardiac murmurs, and it's like, ah, no, no, I don't have that disease. Imagine our patients getting exposure to all this information, they experience the same thing we do in medical school. How do we use our experience to help them to improve? And third is they ask us for partnership. They ask us to say, don't just, you know, don't just tell me what to do. Partner with me what we do. And as we recommend our apps, et cetera, uh, we should do that with them. And I would suggest that as I prescribe apps, I don't want to do that until I myself tried it ourselves. Uh, because I think by doing it myself, for example, the heart rate monitor, I get to know how I can do that. But as we prescribe to our patients, we should keep track with our patients and say, well, how are you using it? Is it helping you and in doing that improvement? But I think the fifth one is most important, and that is that we carry this with humility. Uh, with the type of information, a patient with vested interests will know more about disease than we do. They could go to the extreme, some of them, do the research so that they know the disease. And at many points, we will be less informed than our patients in certain diseases. And so I think we need to be humble 
and work with our patient and what they find we need to be receptive to and work with them. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you, this is the depth of what the patient want with us. And how do we take up that challenge in emergency medicine to support our patients that come through our practice? And so I'd like to call you to action, perhaps. If you feel that digital emergency medicine is important, if you feel that that helps us to improve the care of our patients, if you feel that by engaging our patients that they will have better health without adding medicines, etc., by doing behavioral change, I invite you to consider these. In yourself, what do we need to do to develop our skills? Perhaps you know, learning more about telehealth? Perhaps you know, trying out a few apps? In your practice, what would you do? Would you routinely or would you suggest to your patients some evidence-based site? Would you prescribe an app to your patients? In our health professional community, how can we get together? How can we share these kind of information that we have? Your expertise that you have, how do we, for example, using social media, leverage this? And in our organization, in our hospitals, our health authority, how do we truly partner with patients to lead that forward? Here's a few activities that may, I may suggest to you to consider in British Columbia. Uh, a, very, uh, a colleague of mine, a Dr. John Polovich, a family doctor who practices in Tacla, also in Abbotsford, who do telehealth all the time, he and I have set up a, a routine uh, once every three months round on telehealth. And thanks to Jim and supporting the Department of Emergency Medicine and Department of Family Medicine, working with UBC CPD to offer this round. You can stay in the comfort of your computer uh, and uh, watch this round and participate. Uh, next one's April 15, 2016. If you're interested, let me know. HealthLink BC. A lot of uh, information that our patients do go and seek information. Again, thanks to Eric Grafstein. Uh, really looking at leveraging this, not only setting up the race line, but also in uh, 811 starting to set up a group to advise patients if they call 811 that the nurses have another activity to do that. Very much a form of telehealth in this province. And in fact, some of you in the audience already participate in that. So again, in this telehealth, how do we move forward on that area? Talk a little bit about healthy apps. Talk a little bit about Lindsay's, uh, Heather's uh, aptitude. Um, perhaps how do we you may have exposed already to some apps that you like a lot. How do we share together? Because I can only see a small corner of it. Heather is collecting uh, these. How do you participate so that we can share this as a community in British Columbia so that we can use apps better? And that's why I want to bring you to this site, uh, BC Emergency Medicine. Uh, we have set up a site so that we can have discussion of topics related to practice and continued professional development in emergency medicine in British Columbia. How do we work together on that? I really want to thank the leadership of uh, Anna Cavallo uh, and Heather, uh, my colleagues at VGH, Todd Rain, colleague of yours, at, uh, a colleague of us in St. Paul's. We really want to thank Josh and Paola, uh, our two residents, very, very keen and tremendous expertise themselves, participating in this together. I'd like to welcome you to consider joining BC Emergency Medicine. All you got to do is send me or any one of this individual an email, and we will certainly add you to the discussion group. In fact, Heather regularly put his, uh, her aptitude on there so that you can access those sites. How do you consider talking with patients, understanding their journey in emergency departments? Thanks to Jim with the retreat. Uh, recently, we talked about how do we engage patients. And one of the things that we're going to do this year is try to set up a roundtable discussion, not only amongst ourselves, but also with patients to say, how can we support your journey better? So at the end of the day, you can get the maximum out of the emergency department journey, uh, interacting with us, and how do we truly define patient-centered care with our patients in emergency departments. Finally, very fortunately, uh, we got a grant uh, recently in October uh, with a CHR looking at implementing uh, sensors to discharge patients with heart failure from the emergency department to home so that we can monitor them better, so that we can see if this actually decreased 28-day readmission to emergency departments. And again, thanks to these colleagues uh, in the emergency department of emergency medicine uh, working together to advance this with our cardiologists, also working with Ministry of Health, working with TELUS, working with Vancouver Coastal Health and uh, Province of Health Care to advance this study over the next four years. So hopefully we can roll this out in the province as a, uh, as a strategy. I want to come back to our fearless leader, uh, Jim. Uh, fantastic that he got renewed uh, as our department head for the next five years. He's setting up the BC Emergency Medicine Network. The idea is how do we, 
as people, as health professionals, dedicated to the best practices of emergency medicine? How do we work together to spread the best practices? And I hope that digital medicine will be one of those areas that you'll be interested in. Let me come back to this video. Um, if I can bring that video up. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so how do you change people from the escalator to stairs? I think this experiment has been reproduced in California. I see a similar video of that. Actually, they trans transformed the stairs into a piano keyboard. That's what they did. to focus not only the type of, not only the fact that there's a reduction user escalator in this case, but there are a couple of persons I'd really like you to pay a special attention to. It's gonna come in flashes. You may see a lot of young people and, and healthy people walking. And look at this individual. That person, more than 65 year old, choose to use the stairs. In fact, they found out that 66% of people get converted by this technology. And I submit to you that, in fact, digital technology has that opportunity to actually transform the way we do things. In fact, that has a certain attraction to our patients to do that. And so I'd like to stop now and really start asking your, your thoughts. I went a little bit over time, I apologize. I wanted more time. There's a technology component to about the digital technology, how we can support patients. But we should never forget that what we do is high touch, that we are engaging our patients in very personal ways. And the question is, how can we marry technology and our high touch and partner with our patients so that not only do we form better relationship, but we help our patients to take the action now to transform their care? And how do we, as emergency physicians, commit to improving our patient in their care? Really appreciate your attention. Thank you very much. I'd love to hear your thoughts to see whether you feel digital emergency medicine is one of those forces that we can rally behind and transform the care that we have in British Columbia. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Labs, but how how accurate are they? Like you know, obviously they're great in, in in encouraging patients to take control of their own health. But do you find that they're anxiety provoking at all? Like someone comes in with that ECG app says I was in VFib or I have an O2 sat of 88 for like half a second. Like do you find that that causes any problems? Yes. Thank you very much for that question. I think there are two parts to it. One is the accuracy of the app, and secondly is the appropriateness of the app for the patients. So in terms of accuracy, you're right. Many of those uh, FDA, uh, federal, uh, the, the USA, US agencies trying to regulate app is looking for accuracy. And so in general, when I talk about apps, I look at two grades, consumer's grade and also medical grade. Uh, in many cases, consumer grade is enough to change behavior. Just like my son using Fitbit to measure the steps, it's not 100% accurate. But the fact that roughly it lets you know how many steps you take helps that individual to say, here's my goal, I'm going to set it higher, and you know, every day I may have two or 300 steps that got missed, but in general, it helps me what we do. And I think that's why also it's very important for us when we prescribe an app to try it out ourselves first, to say, is it helpful, is that margin dangerous, or in fact, it's within area that we can actually accept when we prescribe to the patient. Yeah, you're right. Turning to a patient, that's why I said if it's appropriate patients, I'll prescribe that app. Some of them can actually provoke even more anxiety. As you said, you know, palpitations every 24-7, you know, I'll be on that monitor. And also for a sleep app, 
uh, a few times I prescribed, the patient said, I couldn't sleep anymore because every two minutes I wake up and see if I'm sleeping well. <laughs> and so in some ways, you do need to understand your patient's psyche. And that's one of the challenges we have in emergency. We may not, we may not get a good sense about that patient. But I think at some point, though, it'll be really interesting for us to start thinking about how do we select our patients for the appropriate app. Thanks. Anyone from remote sites? Uh, I don't try to see no. sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I can uh, ask a question. Or please, maybe please. a comment. Hi. Um, can... It's striking to me how we think about the elegance of some of this stuff. But really, some of the solutions that you're talking about are very simple. Like, what struck me is prescribing an app. I mean, it's such a simple thing to do that if it's going to, if we believe it's going to help people, I mean, it's really information and way to, for them to help monitor. And we, it, it, it's a difficult thing for old guys like me to change into doing that. But we should help, we should enable that. So with the social media group, for instance, and if Heather's collecting all of this stuff, we should share that information and even just have a handout sheet in our emergency departments where we give them a circle the one that might be of use so we don't have to do a lot of documentation, searching, typing, etc. Just circle it and say, you might want to try this. This might help you. And so there's some simple solutions for some, or so simple ways to change uh, f to use somewhat elegant solutions. Yeah, I um, definitely support so, that. So, so we can work towards that and we can put those on the website as well. And I'd just like to say that from an educational perspective, here we are technology enabled with you across all these sites and 10 people on their home computers listening uh, to Kendall talk. So we're moving that technology and label, enabled Thank learning you, as Thank well. You. Other questions for Kendall? Can uh, you just comment on the Privacy Information Act's mm. effect on dissemination of this data and the security of patient data on all of these apps? Uh, because I guess my concern is, is that if you look at the strict reading of it, sort of as implemented in 2004, a lot of this stuff is, needs explicit consent before there's any sharing of data. Thanks. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, you're absolutely right, especially about electronic medical record, electronic health record, that type of quality of information. There's strict acts to restrict its use. In fact, I think Eric would be a lot better person than I do in discussing that particular topic. I think it's important for us to know and understand the evolution of that sharing and as we start interoperability of electronic records that how our data entered would do that. Yet many times we do ourselves in some ways violate that. Uh, for example, texting an image or texting with another person about a patient in an unsecure text messaging environment, for example. Also, in terms of the apps, uh, one of the things I, I do warn patients about is you know, what's the trade-off for this app? For the heart rate app, you enter your website, maybe your Twitter handle, and maybe one or two pieces of information. Then you get the heart rate. Not too much, you do disclose a little bit about yourself. But in some other cases, if they want your full uh, 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 home address, your earnings, who your family members, etc., you start wondering, you know, should I do this? Also, in terms of Facebook, one of the challenges, uh, that's why our BC Emergency Medicine we talk about general issues. We don't put patient-specific information on that website because Facebook tomorrow can change all the rules and suddenly open it up completely. And you have no control. We have no control over it. And so that, what you've just pointed out, is a very important area. Too broad to fully discuss. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Each of us need to learn about sophistication of how to make sure we protect our own data as we enter into sharing data understand what the stipulations and, and guidance uh, in law for us to make sure that we understand that. So thanks for that question. Yeah, it, it is a fantastic question. It's interesting to reflect on that in a regulatory environment, we push up against this all the time and the things we're not allowed to do, not allowed to share information um, because of the privacy concerns. And yet, every one of us, every day, every time we access anything, all that information goes into some place and advertisers use it. And we don't seem to mind that or we don't know that it's happening but um, there may have be accompanied with this some discussion in in the whole community and the public about what is acceptable so do you accept the fact that there is some risk to transferring your chest x-ray or your ECG if it's going to help in your health care mm -hmm. I suspect the social um, contract would be yes that's a worth worthwhile trade-off but, but we're not there yet um, so, Kendall, I would like to thank you very much thank for you. pushing us into 
the next, into the future, really. And um, what I think is really, uh, it, it's really transformational for what we're going to experience over the next uh, 10 years. And hopefully we'll be ready for it. And hopefully we'll be on the leading edge of it. So thanks very much. Right. Once again. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you.